Good afternoon. Welcome back. All right, today we're going to have two lectures, the first of two lectures where we talk about preventing and curing virus infections. So today we're going to talk about vaccines. And vaccines are a major reason why our longevity has increased from 1900, where we could live 50 years, to today, where we can live 70 plus years. Medicines of different sorts, vaccines, public health measures, toilets and sanitary sewers. You know, New York used to, people used to wake up in the morning with their chamber pots. It's a pan that you would go in at night and just throw it out onto the front step, into the streets, and think about how that transmits diseases. We don't do that anymore. And so all of that has resulted in longevity. And today we're going to talk about one big component of this vaccination, which of course engages your immune system and provides memory in the absence of disease and breaks the chain of transmission. Remember, a vaccine gives you immunity in the absence of disease. Please tell each of you, tell 10 people that, because for some reason they're suspicious about vaccines and people have this idea that they want to get infected naturally. <laughs> you know, the governor of Kentucky infected all his kids with chickenpox virus because he thinks it's better that they get infected naturally. First of all, how does he know? What virology or immunology course has he taken? I can guarantee you none. And secondly, that's baloney because you don't want to get sick. That's the reason we make vaccines, so you don't get sick, because kids die of these illnesses. So today we'll talk about how these work. I mainly want to talk about science, but I cannot resist having some social commentary, because obviously this is in the news right now, that there are big measles outbreaks ongoing. Vaccines give you a protective immune response. Here's a immune response, which we have seen before. We're looking at time and either antibody or T cell number on the Y axis. And you have your first infection. There's about a two week delay before you get a production of antibodies or T cells. And of course, that, that antibody production can't help you that first time, but rather the innate responses and the cellular responses are probably important. After a few weeks, the immunity levels decline to a steady state low level. And then later, when you see that same pathogen, you have a rapid response because you don't have to regenerate all the B cells and T cells. They're there as memory cells, so you have a rapid and very high response, and that prevents reinfection. And this is what a vaccine does. We have that first vaccination. In the absence of disease, you establish memory, and then when you have a challenge, you have a good response. The first vaccine was developed by Edward Jenner, formally, but people were doing this process of, scar of uh, scarification with smallpox many years beforehand. But he made the observation in England that uh, milkmaids who got cowpox rash on their hands from milking cows, they never got smallpox. Smallpox was a disease that afflicted humanity uh, for many years and killed a lot of people. And so he said, well, I'm going to try taking the pox of the, off of one of these milkmaids and giving it to a young boy. So he, he took a pox from the finger of a milkmaid and ground it up. He injected it into the boy. And then two weeks later, he infected the boy with smallpox. Now, he didn't know what a virus was at the time. He didn't even know what an infectious disease was. He just knew, as others did, that there was this disease, and once you got it, if you survive, you never got it again. And if you got this cowpox thing on your hands, it protected you against it. They had no idea about infectivity, immunity, any of that. It's kind of remarkable that he came up with this, and that he waited two weeks before challenging the young boy. The young boy was protected, and from that day on, everyone wanted a little bit of this cowpox. So his cowpox started to be distributed throughout the world, and many people were using it. And it's made its way down to today. Derivatives of it are the smallpox vaccine, which we don't generally use. Only the military and uh, people working in laboratories get smallpox vaccine anymore because we've eradicated that virus from the planet. We introduced the smallpox vaccine for those who get it in a bifurcated needle. 
a little bit of the vaccine is placed in there. You scrape the outer layers of the skin. It replicates very nicely in the outer layers and gives you immunity. I still have my smallpox vaccine scar in my day. Uh, as a kid, I got vaccinated because I hadn't been immunized yet, and you would get this scar. And I remember you could see it on everyone's arm. In the summertime in particular, and some people had huge lesions, and some people had small ones. The next vaccine developed was in 1885. Louis Pasteur made a rabies vaccine. He called it a vaccine in honor of Jenner because vaca means cow, which started the whole thing, and the cow pox of Jenner. Uh, the next vaccines, not till the 1930s, so slow progress here. Yellow fever and influenza vaccines uh, in the 1930s. Of course, as soon as the smallpox vaccine began to have wide distribution, the anti-vaxxers came out of the woodwork. And here is a woodcut from that era saying the cowpox were the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. They thought that this would make you grow cow parts from the place in the body where you were immunized. See, even in the beginning, the anti-vaxxers had no scientific logic to their arguments. These uh, vaccines that we've developed, and we'll talk a little bit about some of them today, have been used in large-scale immunization campaigns. They are very successful. I have two examples here. Upper left, polio. 20 to 30,000 cases of paralytic polio per year in just the US. Vaccine, first vaccine introduced 1955. Salk's inactivated vaccine brought the number of cases down to a few thousand a year. And then the introduction of Sabin's oral vaccine in 1962 has eliminated polio from the US and from most parts of the world as well. Similarly, introduction of measles vaccine in the 1960s brought the number of measles cases down substantially. We would have no measles in this country if everyone were vaccinated as they should be. But as we know, there are people who don't want to get the vaccine and that's why we have uh, these little outbreaks from time to time. This graph on the upper right tells you uh, the number of deaths that have been prevented by using measles vaccine. So here from 2000 to 2012, you have on the top curve the estimated deaths in the absence of vaccination. On the bottom is the estimated deaths with vaccination and the number in between is how many we've prevented. This is a cumulative number. So uh, in this period, we've prevented 14 million deaths globally by immunizing against measles vaccine. So you can die from this, as I told you. You can get encephalitis. We use vaccines in our first world health programs. We immunize children. We immunize adults. Sh uh, shingles vaccine, influenza vaccine in adults. We immunize our pets. Parvovirus, you have to immunize your dogs and cats against those. We even immunize wild animals. We drop rabies vaccine laced bait into the woods from helicopters to immunize wildlife. And that brings the rabies infection down in the wild animal population and really helps curtail the spread. And because of that, many childhood diseases are rare. When I was a kid, everybody got measles. Everybody got chicken pox and mumps, etc. Now they're pretty rare. Most people don't have any sense of them at all. Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe that's why, in part, people don't want to be immunized. Uh, but in third world countries, this is not the case. We don't use vaccines the way we should. You can bet that people in third world countries would love to have the vaccines that many people shun elsewhere. But for a variety of reasons, for money, for um, distribution issues, not everyone is immunized. We talked about this a little bit for measles where huge parts of the world don't get the measles vaccine simply because it's not distributed there, but it should be. Now, the way vaccines work, a key concept in the way they work is herd immunity. And this means you have to maintain a critical level of immunity, but not 100%. So if you have a certain fraction of the population immune, they will protect everyone. And so that is population scale immunity when we talk about herd immunity, not individuals. And the way it works is very simple. You have an infected individual shown on the bottom as this red uh, circle, and that person can shed virus and infect other people around that person. The black circles are non-immunized or non-immune individuals, so they're all susceptible to infection. But if you vaccinate 
a fraction of the population. Now you have immune people, which are shown in green in the middle panel, and they will not be able to be infected. And so they will protect indirectly the non-immunized people because the, the likelihood that they're going to be infected is much less because there are fewer people transmitting the virus around them. So that is what herd uh, immunity is. You are protecting other people by being immunized. And so if you don't feel altruistic, then maybe you don't want to be vaccinated. But in many states, you don't have a choice. Okay? Altruism may not be in your DNA but uh, you still need to be immunized because states are legally bound to protect your health. So you cannot be infected in walking around. I once encountered a physician in Hawaii who told me that it's never been proven that herd immunity actually works. This is, this is absurd. Of course it has, and there are many examples of it working. But people like to make excuses where they see something on the internet that's wrong and they just repeat it. So herd immunity works. It's been proven many times. It's not a reason not to get vaccinated. So as I've said, herd immunity works because the probability of transmission drops, probability that it's going to be transmitted to someone else. Uh, this threshold is, is both virus and population specific. So for smallpox, uh, you need to immunize 80% 80, 80 of the population to stop transmission of the virus. For measles, it's higher. It's 93 to 95%. And this is a general number. It can vary from population to population. Now, the problem here is that no vaccine is 100% effective. In other words, if I gave a vaccine to 100 people, 100% 100, 100 of them will not be protected due to variations in immune systems and other factors as well. So you have to take that into account. Now, here's an example of, on the bottom. When 80% of the population is immunized with measles vaccine, only 76% becomes immune. So 4% do not respond for some reason. And when we immunize people, we don't check to see if you're responding. You just get the vaccine and you're sent back into the world. Of course, ideally, we would take serum from everyone and see if you had antibodies, but we can't do that. It's impossible to do that. And so we have to make assumptions. So for, for this case, you know, for measles, we have to, we can't just be satisfied with 80% of the population. 76% protection is no good. Measles, you need 93 to 95% protection. So again, this is virus specific because the R naught of viruses differ. Measles is very high, and that's why this is higher. It's higher than smallpox. A little bit of social commentary before we go back to the science. The problem here is that complacency is dangerous. You can make the best vaccine. You can spend years working on it and have a great vaccine that induces immunity in a high fraction of people, but if people don't take it, it's useless. And they cannot take it because they don't want to, or they have excuses like you see here that I've heard everyone say. Um, and one of these is, I'm not injecting anything into my body. And that's not an excuse. You do not have the right to infect other people. And herd immunity works, so you have to be part of that. You can't say that. Unfortunately, there are lots of people who don't want to do it, and it's a consequence we have outbreaks. And all of these are excuses. Kids shouldn't get infected naturally. We made vaccines so they wouldn't get infected naturally and die as a consequence. I don't understand why people don't get this. Um, anyway, I can counter each and every one of these for you, but I don't have time to do that now. They're all wrong. And I should also say that in some countries where we provide vaccines, they don't get to the right people. The polio uh, vaccine campaigns, so we're, we're in the process of trying to eradicate polio, in many countries, there's armed conflict that prevents the vaccinators from getting in. Often they get shot. Uh, in Syria, a couple of years ago, the immunization rates for polio went from 96% to 50% because of the civil war. So you can't vaccinate. You can have the best vaccine, but if you can't give it to people, it's useless. And so we can make great vaccines. We can do the science. But this is beyond our control. It's beyond the scientist's control, at least. Here are some examples of outbreaks in the US. This slide is a couple of years old, uh, but it shows measles outbreaks in different areas of the US. 
and often they're in religious communities. Here we have a, an outbreak in Brooklyn in an Orthodox Jewish community. We have an outbreak in a Hare Krishna community in North Carolina. We have an outbreak in Texas. The pastor was critical of measles vaccination. And that's often what happens in these communities. They have spiritual leaders who are critical of the vaccine and people listen to them. That's what happens with the Orthodox community. I was just reading an article yesterday. There's a rabbi in Brooklyn who mistrusts the measles vaccine. So members of community listen to him. Now, he's misinformed. All of these leaders are misinformed. There's no reason to mistrust the measles vaccine. And so we're not doing something correct. Unfortunately, the anti-vax movement in the US is incredibly well-coordinated and well-funded. There is a woman in Austin who actually graduated from Columbia Law School a number of years ago, Ginny Sue. So she moved to Texas and she founded an organization called Immunize Texas, because Texas has some of the highest uh, non-compliance rates in vaccination in the country. Some areas have 50% of the kids are not vaccinated. So she tries to promote vaccination. She says, every week, anti-vaxxers go to the state legislature in Austin and they, they lobby to have a choice in vaccination because they're so vocal and they, they come every week. The legislature thinks that is what the public wants. Now, it shouldn't matter what the public wants in terms of vaccination, but they're being swayed by these people who are so vocal. And we're not. The pro-vax people are not vocal, so we have to change that. Anyway, as you know, there are also outbreaks of measles in other states which are not related to religious communities, but they are in areas where people get together, parents get together, and they talk about it, and they do it en masse. And of course, the measles outbreaks, I've shown you this before, but again, we're having a big one this year. In 2019, we're only into April, and we have more than we had in uh, most of the previous years. This may exceed the 2014 outbreak. Uh, and now, only because of this are, are we doing something. Here is a letter from the Commissioner of Health of New York City, which he sent to all persons who reside, work, or, or uh, attend school in Williamsburg, which is where the main measles outbreak is. And this is a great letter. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but you should take a look at it because it summarizes, you know, he says there's an active outbreak in Brooklyn and measles is highly contagious and we have a vaccine that works. And section 556 of the charter, the department is responsible for controlling communicable diseases in New York. So we have the right to say you have to be vaccinated. So here it says any person who lives, works, or resides in these zip codes has not received the vaccine within 48 hours of this order shot. You must get it or um, show us that you're immune or you can be uh, arrested if you don't do this. In Rockland County, they, ought, they even said if you're under 18 and you're not immunized, you can't be walking around on the streets. So this is the right sentiment. I don't know how you enforce it, but it's good that this letter is here and a fraction of the people are going to get immunized as a consequence. But of course, there's always going to be people who are not. All right, so that's all I will say. I don't know if it's all I will say, but I'll try not to say any more about that part and stick to the science. And here is our first question. Uh, herd immunity, A, demonstrates the importance of immunizing livestock. B, emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect the population. C, emphasizes that everyone must be immune to protect the population. D, describes how the group think can dominate anti-vaccine choices. E, all of the above. Herd immunity emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect the population. That is the correct answer. It has nothing to do with livestock. That was a joke, but one person picked it just to annoy me, probably. That's fine. Emphasizes that everyone must be immune to protect the population. No, that's not what I said. I said not everyone has to be immune, right? I want you to get that. And 29% of you don't. So. Please remember that. Not everyone has to be immune. Uh, how groupthink can dominate anti-vaccine choices. Groupthink certainly dominates anti-vaccine choices. Absolutely. But that's not, that's nothing to do with herd immunity. And finally, all of the above can't be right. So let's talk about the science of vaccines. There are two kinds in general that can be active or passive. Active, you give a modified form of the pathogen or something derived from it that doesn't make you sick but in, induces immunity. It's an active vaccine because it 
causing your immune system to respond. Passive uh, gives you the products of the immune response, which in theory could be antibodies or immune cells, but right now we basically use antibodies as passive vaccines. The, the active, of course, gives you long-term protection because it gives you immune memory. Uh, the passive vaccines, you inject antibodies into people at short term because they degrade eventually after a few months in the bloodstream. Rabies immune globulin as a passive vaccine, which uh, you are given if you're bitten by a rabid animal. It is injected at the bite site to neutralize virus. And you're also given a vaccine at the same time. And this is made from people who have volunteered to be immunized with the rabies vaccine. They take serum from them and they purify the IgG fraction. There are passive vaccines being devised for HIV. We will talk about that probably in the HIV lecture, but there we have identified some broadly neutralizing antibodies that will neutralize a wide range of HIV strains. So people are making those which can be used um, as PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And for flu, people are doing the same thing, and it's conceivable that someday they'll be available for high-risk population. So a nursing home, there's an outbreak of flu, and not enough people are immunized, you give them an antibody or a drug. Those are special situations. You wouldn't use that in a general population. At birth, your mother has given you a passive vaccine, right? As you are developing in, in utero, here's a fraction of adult values for antibodies, and we're looking at conception through birth through adult years, and, and you can see that uh, your mother is, has given you IgG, so at birth, you have that level of IgG in red from your mother. It increases during development. And then you're born, you're separated from your mother, you're no longer getting her IgG, so it goes down. So the red is the maternal IgG. But it protects you for the months until your immune system can kick in. So you have your mother's history of immunity. And so the, the more infectious experiences she's had, the, the better protection you will have. And then in the months, your early months, you start to build up your own uh, antibodies as well until you're, you're capable of doing it. So that's a passive vaccine. Uh, Ebola virus outbreak uh, in 2015, a big one in Western Africa, 25,000 cases. Monoclonal antibody was used, it was tested because it had been being developed in a small biotech company in San Diego, it was called ZMAP. And it consisted of three different monoclonal antibodies, which are shown in color here, binding the viral glycoprotein. The virus particle has glycoproteins in its, in its envelope. And here it is on the right in a structural view. And there are three monoclonals that bind it, and it neutralizes virus infectivity. So these are given to people to try and resolve the infection. Uh, these are monoclonals made in mice by injecting them with virus-like particles, so they're not infectious. And that's because it's very difficult to work with Ebola virus. If it's infectious, you have to work in a BSL-4. The sequence is built into a human scaffold because it starts as a mouse monoclonal. You don't want to put those into people because you'll make antibodies against the mouse antibodies. So you make it human. And then the uh, antibodies are actually produced in plants. So you can do that at high scale and cheaply. They're purified and they're put into people. There's another really interesting story of uh, passive therapy from the 60s. And this is documented in Fever, the book that made me want to be a virologist. This is the story of the emergence of Lassa fever virus in Africa. And what happened was a number of nurses at a missionary started to get sick. A number of them died. This one is Penny Pinio. She was airlifted back to the US in a Boeing 707, sitting with everyone else. And they, they sent her to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And she recovered out of nothing that the doctors did. She's just one of those people that recovered from the infection. And apparently she didn't infect anyone else, which is really nice. But they took her serum. They took her serum and they kept it. Uh, this fellow is Jordi Casals. He was a virologist uh, working at Yale. And he got the virus. He started to work with it. And, you know, in those days, we all used to mouth pipette. And so he pipetted this virus and got infected. He happened to live in uh, Upper Manhattan, and so they brought him to Columbia, and they gave him Penny Pinio's serum. 
They said, let's try treating him with her serum. She recovered. She must have antibodies in her serum, and he lived. So this is a famous example of uh, passive therapy. It's a great book, by the way. A lot of it happens at Columbia because of this episode. So to make a good vaccine, there are a number of requirements. First of all, you have to make the right immune response. It can be, has to be either Th1 or Th2, whatever it happens to be for that virus that is needed for protection, the vaccine has to do it. So you have to figure that out first. And guess what? For HIV, we don't know what it is yet. We do not know what we call the correlates of protection. Do you need antibody or cellular immunity or both? And that's why every HIV vaccine trial fails. Remember Th1 versus Th2, I hope, uh, from our immunology discussion. You also have to be protected against disease. It's not good enough to get an antibody response. So let's say you're testing a vaccine, you enrolled a few hundred people in your trial, you immunize them, you take serum, you say, ah, we have antibodies to the virus. That's not good enough, depending on how you measured them. If you do neutralizing assays, that's good. But then you have to show that they're protected against infection. So you can't infect them yourself for the most part. So you have to enroll these people in a part of the world where the virus is infecting people. If you want to do an Ebola vaccine trial, you have to go somewhere where there is Ebola being transmitted. And right now it's in the DRC. But sometimes there is no Ebola transmission, so you can't test their vaccine. It's not a lot of Zika transmission right now. It's hard to test a Zika vaccine. Flu, no problem. You could test a flu vaccine anytime. HIV, plenty of HIV transmission. But the point is you have to protect against disease. It has to be safe. You can't have side effects. Some vaccines do have side effects. They're not lethal for the most part. You know, the problem is if you immunize 100 million people, a fraction of them are going to just die because they would have died anyway, right? And so that's considered an adverse effect. It gets reported, but it doesn't mean that the vaccine caused that. Uh, you know, we have to remember uh, causation versus association. So minimal side effects. It has to induce immunity, protective immunity in the population. It has to be long-lasting. It has to induce memory. One of the problems with the current flu vaccines is the memory is poor. We're trying to fix that. And it has to be cheap. WHO wants it to be cheap so the vaccine can be distributed throughout the world. You know, the H HPV vaccine, human papillomavirus vaccine, it's a great vaccine. It prevents cancer. It's 150 bucks. People in this country can't even afford it. So this is a big problem getting it to the rest of the world. It has to be genetically stable. We'll see the implications of that today. And storage and delivery are really important. Storage, do you have to freeze it, keep it frozen? Max most vaccines at the moment have to be stored frozen. That is going to change in the next five to 10 years. But in many countries, they've had to develop these um, portable freezers like this one, which is huge. See these guys loading it on a truck. It's big. Keeps the vaccine frozen so you can deliver it to remote areas. WHO actually developed a kerosene-fired freezer to deliver polio vaccine to remote locations. They'd strap it to the back of a mule, and the mule would walk in with this thing. Kerosene is, is running this freezer to keep it cold. And so that's a big problem. And delivery, you know, very few vaccines are given orally. That's easy. No, anybody could do that. A needle, most people hate needles. And, and plus, you need a trained healthcare person to deliver it. And so a needle is, is on its way out. Unfortunately, that's the way most, most vaccines are given right now. But we have some new technologies that are coming along. Here are all the different ways I can think of to make a vaccine. And we're going to go through a few of these today. You start with a virus for which you have identified a medical need, which means a lot of people get sick from it every year. You know, if there are five cases of a virus infection a year, and that there are some viruses in the US where that's what we have, you're not gonna make a vaccine, it's not enough. Medical need, so then you could make a vaccine in a number of ways. You could do what we call attenuating it, you modify it genetically so it doesn't cause disease, but it's still immunogenic. You can inactivate it chemically, so it's an inactivated virus vaccine. You can break it up into pieces and purify pieces that are immunogenic and give those to people. 
So those are all old technologies that have been around for many years. On the right, we use technologies involving recombinant DNA. You could take some of the genes encoding the viral proteins and produce them in different ways. For example, you could produce individual proteins by recombinant DNA technology, make your subunit vaccines by a modern way. In some cases, when you produce a single viral protein, if it's a capsid protein, it will assemble into a virus-like particle. And some of our vaccines, as you'll see, are like that. People have been experimenting with DNA vaccines, where you take a plasmid and you insert a gene encoding the antigen that's protective, and you inject it into the muscle. There's actually a West Nile vaccine for horses, which is a DNA-based vaccine, none yet in people. And finally, you could clone the antigen gene into another virus vector. And we're going to mention this today, and we'll talk about it later when we talk about virus vectors. Here's a list of some of the vaccines that are licensed in the U.S. This is now an older table, and there's some new ones that are not included, but it gives you a sense of what's out there. There are some vaccines that are given only to certain populations. So for example, there is a adenovirus vaccine for respiratory disease. It's only given to military recruits because that's where the disease is prevalent. When you put all these new recruits together, they get outbreaks of adenoviruses that don't typically occur in such big numbers in other populations. There are some travel vaccines Hepatitis A is a travel vaccine. You go to places where the disease is endemic, you should get that. Uh, the yellow fever vaccine is a, another travel vaccine. And, you know, a whole new specialty of travel medicine has emerged as people have been traveling more and more. So if you're going to go somewhere exotic, you should go see a travel physician and find out what, what vaccines uh, you need. I went to a part of Brazil a couple of years ago. They said, you know, it's close to the Amazon. You should get the yellow fever vaccine. So I did. Uh, then we have other vaccines that are needed to go to school. You know, you have uh, your measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, your polio vaccine, uh, rabies. You wouldn't need to go to school. But again, if you get bitten by a rabid animal, they will give that to you. We don't use smallpox anymore. As I said, varicella and varice so varicella universal vaccination of infants. The shingles vaccine is for old people who never had the varicella vaccine and got a natural infection, and now we want to protect them from getting shingles, which is the late sequelae uh, of it. And there's our papilloma vaccine, uh, Japanese encephalitis, another travel vaccine. So you get the picture. There are some that are required in infants or young children and others are needed for certain cases. And we'll talk about some of these and how they work. So first, let's talk about inactivated vaccines where you take your infectious virus and you treat it with a chemical that inactivates infectivity but preserves antigenicity. Things like formalin, propiolactone, detergents. And obviously, you have to test this to make sure whatever your treatment is doesn't destroy the antigenicity. One of the examples I want to give you is a polio vaccine developed in this way, poliomyelitis. We have mentioned, of course, as an acute disease in this course. And here is a description of the disease from a textbook of medicine from 1959, because I think today's textbooks of medicine won't have it in it uh, any longer. Common disease, a common disease in 1959. No more polio in the US. Why? Because of vaccination. And of course, paralysis happens in about 1% of the people. In the U.S., 20 to 30,000 people a year used to be paralyzed. The hospitals were full of iron lungs like this. There's no more of these anywhere except in museums. And I found one on eBay, actually. <laughs> you can buy it for like $30,000. Right? Uh, there's a great museum in Munich that has one, too, on display. But these used to be used. People got paralyzed and they couldn't breathe. They would put them in here and the machine would breathe for them. Most people were able to get out of these, although there's still a few people you can find these articles on these individuals who are living in these old iron lungs at home, 70 and 80 year old people. President FDR had polio when he was in his 20s. Uh, this really frustrated him. And you never see many pictures of him like this. There are only a handful out there like this or in a wheelchair, could not walk without assistance. And he raised the money to make the polio vaccines that we have today. He founded the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. 
He had kids send in dimes to the White House, and that paid for the research into the two vaccines. The first one was an activated polio vaccine. Again, you take the virus, treat it with formalin, so it's inactivated. It went through a big clinical trial in 1954, funded by the money that FDR raised. 1.8 million children, the biggest trial ever done. I think it will never be approached. It's a huge number. And this is pre-computer days. Everything had to be written on cards, all the records on cards and pieces of paper. The results were announced on April 12th, just a couple of days ago in 1955. And it was licensed, and all the headlines said, wow, look, at we have a polio vaccine now, because polio was a big deal uh, in this country. Uh, unfortunately, within a few weeks, uh, there were cases of polio caused by the vaccine because one of the companies, Cutter Laboratories, didn't follow the procedures properly. They didn't inactivate it. So there was some infectious virus uh, in the preparation. And that, that was taken care of and vaccination resumed. The pathogenesis of the virus, just to remind you, you acquire it by fecal-oral contamination. It replicates in your intestinal mucosa, establishes a viremia. 99% of the infections stop there. 1% the virus gets into the central nervous system. It destroys neurons, and that causes the paralysis. So Jonas Salk, who developed IPV, that, that vaccine was introduced in 1955, and it brought the number of cases from 30,000 to about 2,000 a year. The other inactivated vaccine, of course, is the influenza virus vaccine, and we've talked about influenza virus as an acute infection, so this should be familiar to you. It's an RNA virus with viral glycoproteins in the envelope, and those are the correlates of protection. Antibodies against those glycoproteins, mainly the HA, to a lesser extent the neuraminidase, are important for protection. And we can have a lot of deaths per year in the U.S. as a consequence of influenza, so that's why we have developed influenza vaccines. The main one is grown in embryonated chicken eggs, and then it's formalin inactivated or disrupted and injected into you. We make a lot of doses every year in the US. It's only about 60% effect, effective. It's not a good number. We'd like to have it higher and people are working on this. People say to me all the time, I don't get flu vaccine because it doesn't work. Well, it does work, it's just not great, but it will still make you less sick than if you didn't have flu vaccine. And you know what, it could save your life too. So there's no reason not to get it. It's cheap. You can get it almost any place. Probably here you get it for free at Student Health. I get it for free at the hospital. There's no reason not to get it. And it makes it induces antibodies to the HA uh, in the NA. There are also other kinds of flu vaccines now. There are a whole bunch. There's some made in insect cells, in culture. Uh, there, there are other recombinant forms. And as you'll see, we're developing uh, new ones. Now, because this virus changes every year, it undergoes antigenic drift, we have to select every year new strains to make the vaccine with. This is a real problem, and so you have to get immunized every year. And what we do to make this easy, we identify what HA and NA we need, and we reassort those genes into a virus that we know grows well in eggs, because most flu strains that are circulating don't grow well in eggs. So we make reassortants. And if you're curious, this year's vaccine, which the season is coming to an end now, consisted of four viruses, an A H1N1 virus, an A H3N2 virus. These are the de descriptions of the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, and two type B strains. Every year, the WHO does influenza virus surveillance round year in the northern and southern hemispheres. And of course, their winters are opposed, and so the viruses are circulating at different times. And here for the northern hemisphere uh, in January, this WHO, they have a committee who selects strains to be incorporated into that year's vaccine. They look at everything that's circulating, and they make a decision. Uh, they make the reassortants to grow them in eggs. They standardize the vaccines. They look at the potency. They do a, bit, a little licensing, formulating, testing, packaging. And then the goal is, by September 1, to start immunizing people for the rest of the year. And if you want to hear a little more about how these strains are selected, I, I interviewed one of the people 
uh, involved with that. So this is a, a big deal. Con contrast this to measles, mumps, rubella, where the vaccines have been the same for the last 50 years. Virus is not changing antigenically in a significant way. And you just keep making more of it. You don't have to do surveillance and do this every year. So we would like to fix this so we do not have to do surveillance and changing uh, the vaccine from year to year. The vaccine is actually injected for the most part. There is a vaccine that's sprayed in your nose, but most of it's injected and you, in you induce cells that make IgA, which then gets secreted and protects your respiratory tract, yes. I, I think the better vaccine is the one that's sprayed in your nose because it's making local immunity. However, that's always in short supply. But if I had my choice, that's the one I would pick. I think it's better than the injected vaccines. The, the virus changes from year to year, mainly in the hemagglutinin. Here's the virus on the left. The hemagglutinin is blue. That's the hemagglutinin protein on the right. The top of the hemagglutinin, where it binds receptor, it undergoes the most antigenic change. And one amino acid changes in any of these antigenic sites. This is where the neutralizing antibodies bind. One amino acid change can make the vaccine not work as well in any given year. And so that's why we have to keep up surveillance and potentially change the vaccine every year. Next question. Which statement about inactivated viral vaccines is incorrect? A, chemicals can be used to inactivate infectivity. B, they do not replicate. C, they can be dangerous if an activation is not complete. D, antigenic variation can make them ineffective. E, none of the above are incorrect. So chemicals can be used to inactivate, so that's correct. They, they do not replicate, that's correct. They can be dangerous if uh, inactivation is not complete. I told you an example of that with the polio vaccine. Antigenic variation can make them uh, ineffective. That's also correct. So the answer is none of the above, which about half of you got. Let's talk about subunit vaccines where you take either take a virus and break it up in the old school way or modern day you take the gene encoding your antigen, you produce it, say in bacteria or yeast or insect cells, and then you either get uh, subunit proteins or virus-like particles. And these are usually membrane proteins or capsid proteins that are used in these manipulations. And the, there's a brand new one on the market now called Shingrix. It's a recombinant uh, zoster vaccine. So here's varicella zoster virus. When you get this virus as a child, you get chickenpox. Now we have a chickenpox vaccine that prevents that. It's an attenuated vaccine. But if you lived in the era when I was young and you didn't get chickenpox vaccine, instead you got chickenpox, the virus is now latent within you and it can cause shingles. So a shingles vaccine was made for people over 50 who were at risk for shingles. What they did is they took one of the viral glycoproteins, there are a lot on the surface, but uh, glycoprotein E was selected as being the one you need to make antibodies against. The gene for it was introduced into mammalian cells, CHO cells. They remove the transmembrane domain, so the protein is secreted. They purify it. It's mixed with an adjuvant, which we'll talk about in a moment, and it's injected. And you cannot get this vaccine. If you go to the pharmacy, you have to put your name on a waiting list because it's so good. It's almost 100% protective in the populations in which it was tested. The previous version is not as good and so people are lining up to get this. So that's an example of a single protein vaccine. Here's an example of virus-like particle vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine. We talked about hep B in terms of its huge numbers of people infected and the likelihood of getting liver cancer. So this is a cancer vaccine. What we do is we take the surface antigen, which is this protein that makes up the outer surface. So it's, it's a membrane protein embedded in the, in the membrane uh, of the virus particle. <laughs> And it's made by itself, and it assembles into uh, empty particles of various sorts, which are shown there on the right. So there's no nucleic acid in them. They're just, it's a virus-like particle vaccine, and this is very good at uh, preventing infection. And then papillomaviruses, of course, uh, we have wonderful vaccines against these. Papillomaviruses cause wart. Over 170 different kinds of papillomaviruses that cause warts. You can get warts all over your body, as you know. Some of them are transmitted sexually, these viruses that cause warts. It's the most common sexually transmitted disease in the U.S. 
if you look at the numbers, this here numbers taken from a recent uh, New York Times article from a survey, half of Americans are infected with uh, these sexually transmitted HPVs between the ages of 18 and 59. You can see the breakdowns there by sex. So there are warts that you get all over your body caused by these viruses. They're generally not a problem. But if they are sexually transmitted genital warts, they can lead to cancer. Uh, certain serotypes are, are at high risk for cancers of various parts of the body. And we see about 30,000 cases of HPV cancers a year in the U.S., mostly these two types, type 16 and 18. But uh, there can be other types as well. So a number of years ago, several companies made vaccines against these viruses to prevent deaths from cervical and oropharyngeal cancers, for example. And uh, these are made by two, two different companies, Merck and GlaxoSmithKline. The originals were Gardasil, these types 6, 11, 16, and 18. They were made in yeast. And now they have an expanded Gardasil with more serotypes because we see that some of these other types are causing cancers as well. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline has one called Cervarix, which is made in insect cells. And the way these work, you take the gene encoding the major capsid protein, and this is produced either in yeast or in insect cells, and you get empty capsids assembled just from making that single protein. These empty capsids are purified, they're injected into you, and they give rise to antibodies at mucosal surfaces that will protect against infection. And ideally, these are given before sexual activity because that is when these viruses are transmitted. Although it still is worthwhile to have these vaccines well after sexual activity, although there is an age after which they're no longer uh, affected. So this is a great vaccine. As I said, it's very expensive uh, in the U.S., unfortunately. We are working on some interesting vaccine technologies. One is an influenza vaccine made in plants where you take uh, the HA alone and you introduce the HA gene at the plants, and they will make virus-like particles, like this one shown in this electron micrograph. The reason this is interesting is because it's very cheap. A square meter of plants makes 20,000 doses of influenza vaccine, compared to one egg, which makes one dose of influenza vaccine. So a square meter, it's not a lot of plants. And so these have been in clinical trials. Unfortunately, they're not much better than the current vaccines in terms of efficacy, but they're really quick to make, and they are cheap. Now, when you make a subunit vaccine, you have pros and cons. You use recombinant DNA technology, so you can make a new vaccine really quickly. There are no viral genomes, so there's no risk of having infectious virus around. So those are good, but they can be expensive. As I've mentioned, they have to be injected. And they have poor antigenicity because they don't replicate. So why is that important? Well, remember, these virus-like particles are just proteins. There's no nucleic acid, so they don't replicate. They don't kill cells. And if they don't kill cells, they don't cause inflammation. And you remember, good inflammation gives you a good adaptive response. So what do we do? We add chemicals to these virus-like particle or subunit vaccines to make them more immunogenic. And we have a number of adjuvants that we use, that are, some of which are shown here. The HPV vaccines are adjuvanted. The Hep B vaccine is adjuvanted. Shingrix is adjuvanted. And the adjuvants we use can do one of two things. One is that they stimulate the innate immune response, and that causes inflammation. So here, uh, AS1, which is in Shingrix, and AS4, which is in one of the HPV vaccines. This is a toll-like receptor 4 ligand. It's basically monophosphorolipid A, the component of bacteria cell walls, which is known to engage a toll-like receptor and cause cytokine production and inflammation. And remember, that's what drives a good adaptive response. Normally, it's caused by viruses killing cells and antigens being released and detected by APCs, but it's not happening here because these are not replicating. So we put an adjuvant into these vaccines that stimulates the immune response. The adjuvant also helps to keep the vaccine concentrated at the site of injection for longer so you get a better uh, immune response. And there are a number of different adjuvants that have been used. Some cool te technologies coming out 
in the next five to 10 years. One is a microneedle patch. It's going to get around needing needles to inject vaccines. These are small patches with very tiny needles. It's about the size of a Band-Aid, you can see there. The vaccine is impregnated into it. It's put on you with a Band-Aid, so you don't need a trained healthcare worker to do that. You leave it on. The needles go into your dermis. They deliver the antigen there, which is a pretty good place to deliver it. And eventually the needles dissolve. And these have been tested in a variety of settings. And these will definitely be licensed at some point, and they'll replace needles. The other cool development is thermostabilization using sugars. Turns out that you can make vaccines not require freezing by simply uh, drying them with sugars. Um, and here is a thermostabilization of an influenza vaccine with a particular sugar. We're looking at percentage of activity of the vaccine. And you can say it remains uh, at 100% at either 25 or 60 degrees Celsius. That's very hot for 16 weeks. So you don't need to refrigerate these vaccines. The sugar is stabilizing uh, the protein. For flu, people are trying to develop universal vaccines where you would get maybe one every 10 years and it would protect you against all the different strains of flu that would emerge. So every year, you know, as we get antigenic drift, this should take care of it. And one approach is shown here. The key is that on the stem of the HA, the stem has very conserved epitopes that do not change. The epitopes that change are on the head of the HA. So how do you get the immune response to see that? The stem, unfortunately, is what we call immunosubdominant. If you inject an HA molecule into a person, most of the antibodies are made to the head. But what to do to direct them to the stem? Well, here's the approach that's used here. You make a recombinant protein where the stem is an H1N1, which is a human virus. And then you put the head from a HA, uh, from a virus that doesn't infect people. Here it's an H9. You immunize, you get an immune response to both the head and the stem. And then you boost them with a different recombinant HA where the stem is the same, but now you've changed the head. So now you're getting a primary response against the head and a memory against the stem. And that's been, and you can do that several times. And that's how you get a good immunization against stem epitopes. So this is one of several approaches that are being tried to get universal vaccination. Again, the idea is that the antibodies against the stem will neutralize whatever flu strain emerges. So you will only need to get this uh, once every 10 years or so. Next question is, what are some requirements for an effective vaccine? Low cost, ease of administration, provides long lasting immunity, minimal side effects, all of the above. Most of you got the right answer, which is all of the above. They're all requirements for an effective vaccine. The other big group of virus vaccines are the attenuated vaccines. They're infectious or replication competent. We take a virus and somehow we modify it genetically that it no longer causes disease. It will replicate, stimulate immune responses, but cause mild or no disease. And the idea here is that, you know, with an inactivated vaccine, sometimes you have to give several boosts to get a good immune response because the virus is not replicating. But with a replication competent vaccine, it's amplifying itself in you without causing disease, get a better immune response. And this is historically been done empirically. What do I mean by that? You take a virus and you grow it in a different cell. So here we have a human virus. We grow it in an animal cell. And we do that multiple times. We take the virus that comes out. We reinfect those cells. And along the way, the virus, you select for viruses with mutations that reduce the ability to grow in human cells, that grows better in monkey cells, and doesn't cause disease in humans. And this, is, this used to be done just empirically, passage viruses in different ways, and just test to see if they lose their pathogenesis. Now we can do this in a more directed way. And an example of this is flu mist, flu vaccine, which is infectious. It's a replication competent, intranasally administered vaccine. It's put into your nose with a syringe without the needle, of course. You don't need the needle part. You just, it's just sprayed into your nose. 
You inhale it into your upper tract and it replicates in the mucosa and gives you good local immunity. And these, uh, these are made from master donor strains, so we can take whatever is circulating and reassort it into this strain, which is already temperature sensitive and attenuated. It will replicate only in the upper tract. Very clever thing they did here. They, they made these viruses cold adapted, which means they need the low temperatures of the upper tract to replicate. They will not replicate in the lung, so they don't cause disease. As I said, I think this is the better of all the flu vaccines. If you could get it, it often runs out. The other example I want to tell you about is poliovirus, the Sabin oral polio vaccines, which are introduced in, in the US in 62 and have eliminated polio from many countries. These are ingested. You drink them, they replicate in your mucosa, they establish a transient viremia, but they don't invade the central nervous system. And these were made empirically by Albert Sabin in the 40s and 50s taking the three serotypes of poliovirus and passaging them in different animals and different cell cultures. And at each step, he would take representatives and put them in an animal and see if they were able to cause paralysis or not. And in the end, he got three serotypes uh, that did not cause disease. They were immunogenic, and they were licensed in 1961. In the, in the 80s, uh, when we got the ability to sequence viral genomes, our lab and others sequenced Sabin's three serotypes and we found the mutations that allow it not to cause disease. So these very few mutations separate these vaccine strains from the virulent strains. And I told you about these mutations before. They're located in the five prime non-translated region of the viral RNA in the highly structured area. And all three serotypes have a mutation in uh, more or less the same region. And these mutations are important for reducing the virulence of these vaccine strains. These mutations revert when you take these strains orally. So again, they're given to children orally, they replicate in the gut, they're shed. We found uh, early on that these viruses revert. So here's the Sabin vaccine at 472, that's a U, the attenuating base. But in this particular child, within 47 hours, the U has reverted to a C, so this child is now excreting virulent viruses, which when you inject into an animal will cause paralysis. And this happens in every child who gets these vaccines. And in a small fraction of recipients, it causes polio. And so in the US, the introduction of the Sabin vaccine in 1961 eliminated wild virus circulation by 1979, the last case of wild polio in the US. But these bars are all cases of polio caused by reversion of that vaccine. You can see from 10 to 20 a year. Until 2000, we decided that was not acceptable and we switched back to the inactivated polio vaccine. So no more vaccine associated uh, polio. Now the WHO is in the middle of a campaign to eradicate polio. And originally they declared this in 1988. It was supposed to happen by 2000 and we were going to stop immunizing already by 2010. So we're a little behind schedule, but we're actually not doing badly. The question is then, can you eradicate any infectious disease? And the only one that we have done for humans was smallpox, which was eradicated in 1978. And this is what smallpox does to you. And this is why we have a vaccine against it. To eradicate a virus, you have to have two features. First of all, it replicates only in one host, in our case, humans. It can't be any animal host. And vaccination has to give you lifelong immunity. Those two conditions were met for smallpox, and we were able to eradicate the disease. And polio meets these two as well. There's no other host, and immunization gives you lifelong immunity. So we began the eradication campaign in 1988, about half a million cases globally in these dark red countries. Every 10 years, 1998, fewer and fewer countries. 2008, only five endemic countries. And we're, here's where we are today. Uh, this is uh, year to date in uh, 2019. We've had seven cases of polio last year, 32 cases of wild polio, 100 cases caused by the vaccine. So these are the revertants that cause polio in the recipients or spread to other people. And we've never interrupted wild polio spreading in two countries, Pakistan 
in Afghanistan, mainly because we cannot get in to immunize people because of conflict in those regions. But if we could get in, we would be able to eliminate the virus from those regions. These other yellow circles are outbreaks of vaccine caused polio, which happens when immunization levels drops, the vaccine viruses are circulating, they're revertant, they get in and they cause paralysis. So the WHO is in the process of switching from OPV to IPV, which is hard because it has to be injected, but that's gonna be the only way to get rid of those uh, cases. And I'll leave you with this interesting thought. Even if you eradicate any virus, as long as you have the nucleotide sequence, you can make the virus again. And here's an example of a pox virus, 300,000 bases. They had the sequence. The virus is gone, but they wanted to recover it. And they just had all the oligonucleotides synthesized and thrown into cells, and out came some horsepox virus. So no virus is ever really eradicated because the sequences are all publicly available. All right, let me end up with a couple of examples of some using some new technologies to make new kinds of vaccines. And this starts with uh, yellow fever, first virus, human virus identified, mosquito transmitted, serious disease. We decided to make a vaccine. Actually, uh, Max Tyler here at the Rockefeller made the vaccine by passing a wild strain 176 times in chick embryo tissue. And that attenuated the virus. And it is now, if you go and get the yellow fever vaccine, that's the virus you're getting that Max Tyler made. We've distributed a lot of doses. It's safe and effective. Here, here we now introduce dengue, serious viral disease, especially if you get second infections. It's also a flavivirus. So what they did is they took the yellow fever vaccine and replaced the glycoproteins with the sequences from dengue virus because we already know yellow fever vaccine is safe. Let's just build dengue on top of it. So that's the basis of this uh, new vaccine called Dengvaxia. Again, it's dengue virus glycoproteins for all four serotypes in the yellow fever backbone. It's been licensed in several countries. Unfortunately, it's not great. It doesn't protect against dengue type two. And in fact, it makes worse disease probably by antibody enhancement mechanisms that we have talked about. Fortunately, other people are working on a, a different kind of dengue vaccine. And here it was found that if you delete 30 nucleotides in the three prime non-coding region of the virus, virus still replicates, but it doesn't cause disease. And so uh, this has been the basis of a tetravalent uh, vaccine called TV003, 100% protection so far versus challenge. So probably this will be licensed uh, very soon. The most recent vaccines to be developed were against Zika virus, which we recognized globally in 2015 from a large outbreak in Brazil, but had actually been identified in 1947 and Uganda spread eastward through a variety of countries without any epidemics until 2007, a big epidemic on Yap Island, followed by French Polynesia, and then in 2015, invasion of Brazil. And this virus, was originally thought to be quite benign. A rash-like virus similar to dengue and chikungunya, short incubation period, and rare fatalities. Conjunctivitis, you can see there, uh, rash all over the body. But in the Brazil experience, we realized that there are central nervous system complications associated with infection. There are a number of adult infections of the CNS, and of course, in infants who are infected in utero, we could have microcephaly, and a number of other uh, congenital defects. And for these reasons, uh, vaccines are being developed. And you know, this picture I showed you earlier with all the ways of making vaccines I could think of, that is what's being done uh, for Zika virus. And let me just run you through a couple of the different vaccines. In one, a DNA vaccine. They took the genes encoding uh, the membrane and envelope protein. They put them in a plasmid. It's injected right into your muscle. And here are two experiments in mice. You infect mice with Zika virus. This is viremia. And these are mice who got the control vaccine. So they make high titers of virus in the blood. These are mice immunized with the DNA vaccine. Completely blocks the viremia. So that's one candidate vaccine. 
Now, another one uses vesicular stomatitis virus as a vector. VSV has been modified so it doesn't cause disease in humans. You can take the glycoprotein gene of Zika virus and insert it for the glycoprotein gene of VSV, make chimeric particles, and these have also been uh, tested in phase one trials in people. And, and finally, the, uh, if you remember, the new experimental dengue vaccine was found that a 30 nucleotide deletion uh, in the three prime UTR made a good attenuated vaccine. Well, they did the same experiment for dengue. They deleted uh, 30 bases from the three prime N, and this induces good immunity in mouse models. So they're quite, and these are just a few of the Zika virus uh, vaccines that are in development. The problem is, of course, there's no transmission at the moment to test these vaccines, and we have to wait for the next outbreak. This vaccine for us in the US will be a travel vaccine because Zika does not circulate within the US with the exception of a small part of Miami and the most southern part of Texas. So we will not immunize people here in the US, but if you travel to an endemic country, this is the vaccine uh, that, you, that you will get, presumably, when it is licensed. All right, next time we're gonna talk about what you do if you're not vaccinated and you get infected. Can we give you antivirals to cure the infection? <laughs>